Hello, it's my privilege to be here today to give you a quick but uh, nuanced conversation about what we know about the uh, biology of adversity and also uh, future directions, what people are working on um, and what we're hoping to learn and how we can think about using this information in a meaningful way. Um, I am today representing the members of my, uh, my research center and this type of work takes a huge uh, number of people to complete and I also will be highlighting work um, done by other groups in other parts of the country because of course to give a picture of what we know we have to um, depend on the expertise and effort of many people. So what is the current state of the science of inequity and what could we learn by considering what is known and what could be known to move families from inequality to opportunity. So first, what is the current state of the science? Um, there are um, large samples of folks that have been studied across their lifespan or looking at census data or other types of big data sets where we can connect how long people live, what kind of quality of life they have to factors like income. So using that kind of information, we have seen rising inequality in mortality um, as connected to, to income. So at the same time, as you can see on the right side, at the same time that income inequality gaps have been increasing, the cost of those income inequality gaps on lifespan have also been increasing. So it's not simply, um, it's not a simple relationship, right? So what is contributing to this cost to total life expectancy when people are experiencing lower income? Um, we also see inequities in terms of race, gender, um, and ethnicity. And some of those changes are changing. So trying to track that information across time, we currently have a big 10-year gap between the healthiest Americans, which are currently Hispanic females, and the least healthy Americans, which are currently black males. Um, but trying to figure out what is contributing to those, um, those inequities, right, in lifespan, and how can we intervene to make healthier, happier, longer lives for all of us, and keeping track of that information across time and realizing that it's not static. So if you look at the group dynamics across time, those change. And of course, every person is many things. Um, we all have many labels that could be uh, attributed to us. So determining for any individual what might contribute to your lifespan is many things in addition to income, race, gender. Um, we see these health gradients emerging very early. So you can see um, in the graph to the left that children start to show differences in their quality of health or sort of their overall health um, status um, really pretty early um, between uh, family income at ages zero to three, you can already see some differences, and then those differences increase across the entire lifespan. So by nine to 12, you're starting to see bigger differences, and those continue um, across time. So that data comes from the um, panel of income dynamics study, um, and there's a lot of information in there. But of course, it still doesn't tell us how does that happen, right? What are the features, what are the components of experiencing low income? that contribute to these health gradients. And you can think of many, many things that might um, contribute. For example, um, quality of healthcare, access to healthcare, resources, um, violence, um, and then also some family factors. You may have heard of the ACEs study. It's been very impactful. Um, connecting, again, experiences in childhood, so retrospectively asking adults about things that happened in their childhood, and connecting those to their lifetime health. So in this big study with 17,000 people, they were able to determine that when people reported many adversities in their childhood, that was connected to both having more chronic health conditions and a shorter lifespan by an order of magnitude of 20 years. So experiencing these early adversities is one possible mechanism that might be explaining how early differences in income might be contributing to long-term health. But it's one piece of the puzzle. So you may have heard the, this referred to as the social determinants of health. You may have heard that, um, that language. And I have some concerns about that language. One, uh, one is that there, some of these issues are social, but many of them are structural. Um, and determinants suggest 
that it's deterministic. And that's not at all what, uh, how I would read the evidence. So I would read the evidence to suggest that many, many families change their circumstances and that health is a dynamic thing. It, it is snapshot in time, tells you what trajectory someone is on at the moment, but it doesn't tell you how to move that trajectory. It doesn't tell you what might move that trajectory regardless of whether you do something. It doesn't give you all of that nuanced information. Um, so you may have also seen some of these data on early brain development. Now, we are these amazing creatures with these big, fantastic, pl plastic developing brains that do all kinds of things for us. They do not develop in a simple linear fashion. They change across time. They reflect all of your experiences. So when you take a snapshot at a moment in time, you can see differences in total brain volume by family income. Um, so this is by three years of age. Now notice that the kids do not differ at, at birth, right? So they're not starting out different, but by three years of age, um, potentially as a result of differences in experience, they have different total brain volume. Okay, that doesn't tell us much, right? It doesn't tell us about how the brain is different, what might be contributing to that. Um, in a different study, this is by Kim Noble's group, and you may have also come across this work. Um, this is looking at income differences between three and 20 years of age and showing a fairly substantial impact of um, differences in experienced income at a snapshot of time in surface cortical area. Um, a couple things I wanted to point out about this in case you've seen this um, paper and not had a chance to read it. One is there's a lot of variability. So all those little blue dots are people um, and you see a lot of variability at every time point. Now the variability actually kind of shrinks across time. So you see on the left hand side of the graph are folks who are experiencing lower income at that snapshot of time where it, was, where it was taken. The other thing I want to point out is that there's compression at the left side of the graph, um, which suggests that at the left side of the graph, under, in, with the families experiencing the lowest levels of income, every dollar matters, okay? That stops having the same effect as you get up the income gradient. So efforts to change um, family income in that range, which could take a small amount of infusion, may have really big beneficial effects. So this group is working on examining the role of cash transfers in, um, in brain development, which is really, really critically important. So again, thinking about that structural um, support that we might be able to provide to a family to make uh, differences in this range. And also, again, thinking about that in a dynamic way, right? This is a snapshot in time. This is not telling you about this person's life forever. This is telling you how things are looking right now. Um, we do see an intersection of uh, time periods in the lifespan where you have um, more influence, right? So when babies are little, things really matter. And there's other times in the lifespan that are also really important. So this is a study from Finland with almost 40,000 folks showing that um, uh, health matters when you experience adversity at more than one time point in the lifespan. So in this study, they had individuals who had high childhood adversity and high adulthood disadvantage had the worst um, cardiovascular outcomes, so, so different kinds of cardiovascular events. Really pretty dramatically different, and this is a huge, huge sample, okay? And this is a, a, a country with a more stable uh, economic structure. Um, and so, and then the low childhood adversity and low disadvantage, so that double protection was also important. Um, a similar study in Minnesota looks at the very special periods of, of early childhood and adolescence. So adolescence is a fantastic opportunity for a reset. Um, the brain and body are changing dynamically and looking to see, how, what is this world like? What can I do as an adult? And so it's an opportunity again for a reset, but if an individual experiences low resource and high threat, both in early childhood and in adolescence, that conveys to the brain and body that it's a certain kind of world. Um, a lot of this science is the science of adversity. It's about understanding how negative things get into your body and stick with you. Um, and so you see things like this uh, pyramid, which is from the ACE study about how these early adversities lead to changes in behavior and chronic conditions and ultimately result in death. Um, when you have that kind of framework, then you're gonna look for tags that you can measure about people's lifespans. So this is looking at cellular aging, which you can measure in saliva samples to see what someone's functional versus chronological age is. 
um, and where they are on that sort of lifespan trajectory. Again, I think there's a role for the science of adversity. It's important to understand how these work. Um, but that suggests a determinism that is not appropriate. So your cellular, markers of your cellular aging are also dynamic. If you make changes to your lifestyle, like increased exercise, um, more meditation, you can regrow your telomeres, so you can make your cellular age longer. Um, so how could, this, how could we think about a science of protective factors? Um, we think about, I'm an Ascend Fellow, and we think a lot about um, how, to, how to work with families. So families are changing, the babies are changing, the parents are changing, they're all kind of changing together, trying to move forward. So when we take that kind of framework and consider that there's multiple sensitive periods across the lifespan, how could we expand our science and our policy to take into account that we have multiple changing agents? Um, for example, you could take the ACE study, which usually what we do is point to the red individuals and say, um, you have that six in 10 people are gonna have depression if they have five or more ACEs. Well, what about the four people that don't have depression? What about the three people who don't have any events? Um, can we get in there and study how those people, how those families are succeeding in this context of adversity? What are the biologic factors? What are the structural supports? What are the behavioral factors? Um, so in a recent uh, body of work, we've been looking at data from four big national data sets that are not about poverty, four big public uh, national data sets, combine them together, and look to see about how families move in and out of adverse circumstances and what things coalesce. So um, I know there's a lot of information on here. If you look at the solid black line, the low risk group at, at the first year of life has low poverty and high maternal education. Those are their de uh, de defining features. There are two groups of families experiencing poverty. One group of families is experiencing low levels of insecurity, and the other group is experiencing higher levels of insecurity, housing instability, food insecurity, financial instability, like we've been hearing about. So let's then look at those same families, because these are longitudinal data sets at age three. Now 90% of the families are in the low-risk group okay, in that three-year period. Um, so I just think that in and of itself is an important conversation. And then when we look at the families who moved out of poverty versus those who did not, the difference is in the instability. So the housing insecurity, the food insecurity, and the financial insecurity. Um, so in the stress and adversity world, that makes perfect sense because it's uncontrollable, um, unpredictable stressors that really damage your health. So we've been working on this and trying to think about what that means for intervention. And this is just showing you how people, how people moved. Um, so the vast majority of 99% of people who were low risk at time one were also low risk at time two. How can we think about how this works in the body? There's something called epigenetics, which is how your genes are expressed. We can look at how your environment changes the way your genes are expressed across time and see if protective factors mark your genome in a way that adverse factors do, and I think that they will. Um, there are animal models to suggest that that should be the case, and we are working on that now. So I am basically advocating that we consider a more nuanced view of the science, that we talk about it even when you only have 15 minutes, uh, <laughs> carefully, right? Talk about it carefully. These are changing things. Families are experiencing poverty at a snapshot moment in time. We can change that, and we can look at what happens when we change that, right? We can, these are not stable factors. They're not stable on their own, and they're not stable when we intervene. So we can consider the timing, the relationships of the family, the individuals we're working with, um, family broadly defined, and we can consider the context of support that might be available or not available for that family. So what are the structural, um, structural inequities? So what is the timing, the relationship, and the context of the adversity, of the inequity, of the intervention, of the prevention? <clears throat> and can we take advantage of sensitive periods of development early in life, adolescence, and the transition to parenting? And of course, this work is um, funded by many agency. So I am 37 seconds ahead of time. <laughs>